Jesus promised his disciples in Acts 1.8, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Welcome to You Shall Receive Power, and here are your hosts, Etienne McClintock and Colin Hone. Dear listener, greetings and a warm welcome. Thank you for tuning into the program again today. Colin and myself are delighted to have your company. And as we start our Bible study, we just invite you to join us in prayer, asking God to bless our study this morning. Dear Gracious Father in Heaven, we thank you for all your blessings. We thank you for all that you mean for us, do for us, and for Jesus Christ that can cover us with his righteousness. Not only, Father, cover us, but also have his righteousness work within us Mm. to transform and change our lives, Father, so we can become more like you, that we can be loving and lovable Christians. And, Father, as such, we just pray for a fresh anointing of your Holy Spirit upon us and also upon those watching and those who are listening. May we be drawn closer to you, Father, and may the love of God be revealed in our lives and in our hearts and in our actions with one another, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, last week's program, we actually dealt with the white raiment. Now, why are we talking about white raiment? There are seven churches in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 3. So these are early introductions to the book of Revelation, Colin. Yes. And the very last church mentioned there is the church of the Laodiceans, which is a lukewarm church. Their works are not hot. Their works are not cold. They are lukewarm. But then the faithful and true witness, which is Jesus Christ, he counsels of the latest sins, it counsels them to buy from him three things because they are poor, blind, and naked. Now, to cover their blindness, he offers them eye self. Now, the eye self we already spoken about is the Holy Spirit, which gives us spiritual discernment to understand spiritual things because spiritual things are spiritually discerned. And then, of course, we are now dealing with the nakedness of this church. And Christ is counseling them to buy white raiment that the nakedness will be clothed so their shame is hidden. And this is what we're talking about. So last week we spoke about the justifying righteousness of Christ in regards to his white raiment. Now we are talking about the sanctifying righteousness. That's right. And so we're going to talk about Christ's sanctifying righteousness. Now the great controversy has always been over Christ and God's law. Mm. You know, we read this in the book of Revelation when the you know, this great controversy first began in heaven in Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 to 10. And uh, if you could just read that to us, that'd be great. Okay. This is giving us insights right to the very beginning of this great controversy or when sin entered the universe. And it says, and war broke out in heaven. Now, the word war there in the Greek is the word polemos, mm. where we get the word politic from. And politics is something that started in heaven. An opposition party started in heaven. Under the dragon And we can read this It says Michael and his angels fought With the dragon And the dragon and his angels fought So it wasn't a You know Lightsaber Star Wars You know With lightsabers war It was actually a political war Over a argument Yes uh, Yes And uh, different ideals Ideals. Different ideologies That's right Yes So it's almost like You've got you know You've got socialism And capitalism It's almost like that But of course That breaks down In regards to God's uh, Communism Democracy You have different types of Different types So it's an opposition uh, that, That was set up there Yeah And it says there that after the fight, it says that they did not prevail. So they are the dragon and his angels. They did not prevail, nor was place found for them in heaven any longer. And in verse 9, so the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And reading verse 10, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and the strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accuses them before God day and night has been cast down. So that's that's the reading there just talking about how this conflict started in heaven. But what was the conflict really about, Colin? Well, it's over God's law and over Jesus. And so, you know, the same basically... Satan hates God's law and he seeks to replace it. Mm. You know, he said basically he's saying we can be holy without keeping God's law. We don't need a law to dictate to us, to tell us what it means to be holy. We can okay. be holy by, by our apart own. Apart from the law. Apart from the law. So the, 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 Satan talked about the law in a legalistic sense instead of in a loving sense. He denied the principles of self-sacrificing love. Why? Because he was trying to exalt himself. And he also... 
accuse God of, well, where's your self-sacrificing love? Mm. Okay. And obviously it was demonstrated on the cross, wasn't it? Absolutely. It was demonstrated Without on the cross. question, yeah. And so Satan hates Christ and he's always tried to replace him. He wants to replace okay. him. He wants to take that place. And we can read that in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12 to 14. And it says, How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations? For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farther sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. So he obviously had an eye problem. <laughs> and, uh, yes, he did have an eye problem. He had he major eye problem. too much time in front of the mirror, perhaps. That's right. And yeah. uh, it was all about I, I, I. But mm. I was, he wanted to be above God. Mm. Okay. But that's such different contrast to Jesus, where Jesus says, nevertheless, not, not my will, yes. but thy will be done. Here we see Lucifer. It's all about his will, about all about him exalting himself above the heights of the clouds, sitting on the mount of the congregation, which is where God sat. That's where God's throne is, and wanting to be like the Most High. Exactly. exactly. Now, the, the law of God didn't allow to have any other gods. And the first and the great commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. No. And the first commandment out of the ten is, you shall have no other gods before me. So he was actually trying to break the constitution, the ground law, the, the, the law of God's government, and saying, if I can get rid of that law, then I may, perhaps will be permitted to be like God as well. And let's, have, let's really have a think about this. Hmm. He deceived a third of the angels. Right. And these, aren't, these weren't, you know, like fallen angels, like, you know, or fallen well, they weren't fallen at that time, At were that they? time, but fallen human beings, you know, yeah, after yeah. Adam, and, Adam and Eve. These were holy angels. Hmm. So the argument must have been very, very uh, a good argument. That's Let's right. be honest. How could you yeah. deceive a third of the angels unless you had a reasonable argument? Hmm. We can be holy without keeping the law. And we don't need a law to tell us how to be holy. We should right. naturally just be able to, from our own... Ways just and and but little did they know that Satan was undermining the law so that so he could seek worship. Mm. That was his. Op- he was working very subtly and through political means. So he hates God's law and he's seeking to replace it. Yeah, and the fact that you mentioned the third there, we get that out of the same chapter of Revelation, Revelation chapter twelve, and from verse three and four. I'll just read there quickly. It says, and another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems or crowns on his heads. And his tail drew a third of the stars. Now, stars represent the angels. We get that in Mm. chapter 1. Stars represent angels. A third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth. That's right. And you only have to look at history. You know, Satan has set up um, kingdoms, and most of the kingdoms have a form of worship. And the idea is to replace the worship of God to worship to him. Okay, so he receives worship through these other false or pagan religions or whatever religions you may well like to call them. That's Counterfeit right. Counterfeit religions. Yeah. That's right. So the same controversy, though, takes place in the lives of men and women today. Satan desires to reign on the throne of the heart. He wants to reign on the throne of the heart. He mm. wants mankind to follow his ways, not Christ's ways or God's law. Yes. And in the era of Christian living, he wants to replace Christ's righteousness, right, for example, with man's efforts to become righteous, wow. which is legalism. The same argument when you think about it in heaven. Mm. You know, we don't need, we don't need a law to be righteous. we're holy anyway. We're holy anyway to yeah. be righteous. We can be righteous by our own Works. efforts. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And so, which is legalism. He mm. wants them to look to their own efforts for righteousness rather than Christ and his righteousness. He wants them to look to themselves for obedience rather than to Christ manifesting his obedience in and through them. Right. That or, is incredible. You know, the, Isaiah, we just read before in Isaiah 14 about Lucifer and he had an eye problem. Mm. I will, I will, I will. Uh, Isaiah 64 and verse 6 says that we are all like an unclean thing and all our righteousness are like filthy rags. So our righteousness does not measure up to the righteousness which the law demands, which is that love, that self-sacrificing love that we see in the life of Christ. Yeah, and Paul mentions that too. There is none righteous, not one. Not one, that's right. The only one that's so righteous. no one is excluded on this planet. That's right. The only mm. one that's righteous was Christ. Amen. And um, so, you know, Satan wants us to look to ourselves for obedience rather than to Christ manifesting his obedience in and through them. Mm. Or on the other hand, Satan leads individuals, this is what he can do as well, he uh, 
leads individuals to believe full and complete obedience to God's law is impossible. In other words, it's always one or the other. Yeah. Do it by your own righteousness. Yeah. Okay, by your own works, or it can't happen. And again, that is a half truth, isn't it? That's right. Depending on how you look at it, it is false. Or it can be true. And the whole thing with, with Satan is he's always used half truth. He's always disguised error wrapped up in some elements of truth to make it believable. Why would you drink it? <laughs> Why would you yeah. drink it if it was just full if you just saw you know, if someone gave you a cup of poison, yeah. it looked like poison, you know, it tasted like poison. Mm. So you see it, you could looks it, you taste it. You wouldn't drink it, would you? No, wouldn't drink it. That's but really if someone hand you a, what your, whatever your favorite drink is yeah. and it looked like your favorite drink. It even tasted like your favorite drink, mm. yet there was a bit of poison that you couldn't see and what couldn't taste. You would take it. You'd swallow it. That's You'd probably right. enjoy it until you get the effects of it. The effects of it, yeah. which is that, yeah. So that's exactly the way Satan works. And so Satan leads individuals to believe fully, well, to believe full and complete obedience to God's law is impossible. Mm. And either error is the result of being deceived by Satan's omega apostasy. Yes. Either one is his omega apostasy. However, it is only as God's people experience Christ's righteousness, obedience in their lives, that they're able to come out of their latest sin condition. This is how they receive what, they, what we call the right raiment God says they must have in Revelations chapter 3, verse 18. They need to have this white raiment, mm. which is Christ's righteousness. Sure. And I can read that there in Revelation chapter 3, verse 18. So this is speaking to the latest sin church, the seventh yep. church, the last church. I counsel you to buy of me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white raiment that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with ourselves so that you may see. Now we know that that's Christ's righteousness. He's the only one who has any righteousness. So mm. so basically man's natural response is to seek righteousness by our works, by our own efforts. Uh, and it comes natural to us. Yeah, it does. We, I mean, let's be, we're raised with the teaching that if we want to want something, we have to work to get it. That's right. Rewards and benefits are the result of our efforts, isn't it? Mm. If you do this and this and this, you'll get this, this, that's this, right. this. Yeah. It's you know, effort and reward, isn't it? It's the it, principle of effort and reward. That's right. And even that saying, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. I mean, that's been ingrained to us as, as, as kids, you know. That's right. So we always used to try to put in effort. And if you don't, if it doesn't work the first time, just try harder. That's right. But it doesn't work in spiritual matters, does it? No, it doesn't. <laughs> and so when God delivered, for example, in Exodus chapter 19, verse 7 to 8, when God delivered Israel from their Egyptian bondage and gave him his commandments and statutes, we read their response. What was their response when God gave him the commandments? Okay, Exodus 19, verse 7 and 8. So Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before them all these words which the Lord commanded him. Then all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. So Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. Did they do it? No. Well, within 40 days, we know that they'd actually started to worship a golden calf, and they were having a nice little festival there while Moses was up on the mountain getting the Ten Commandments. And you look at the history of Israel constantly trying through their own efforts to keep the law of God. Mm. They couldn't do it. Yes. <laughs> and I believe God knew they could not accomplish obedience in their own strength, However, he honored their statement knowing they needed to learn for themselves that they had promised something that would be impossible for them to fulfill by their own efforts. And Absolutely. this is called the Old Covenant in the Bible, wasn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah. Israel's promise to obey God by their own efforts, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. You know, it's interesting that uh, when they are led into the promised land under Joshua, because Moses now has, uh, has passed away, you know that statement where he says, as for me and my house, Wisdom. Choose you this day whom yep. we will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Yep. And then Israel says there in Joshua chapter 24 and verse 18, he says, but we also will serve the Lord for he is our God. And then Joshua says in verse 19, and this is an interesting reply, he says, but Joshua said to the people, you cannot serve the Lord. He is a holy God. He is a jealous God, and he will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If you forsake the Lord he will ser um, and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after he has done you good. And the people said to Joshua, no, but we will serve the Lord. Now, we know the history of Israel shows that they could not fulfill that promise. That's right. But that is an old covenant response. Instead of relying on the Lord, they were trying to rely on themselves, and they had confidence within themselves that they were able to do that and fulfill the covenant. That's right. Israel's promise to obey God by their own efforts 
all that the Lord has spoken we will do. Mm. And as you said, through the centuries to the time of Christ, the Jewish leaders and people still thought that they could be righteous by keeping God's law. You know, we look at the rabbis and Pharisees were so convinced of this that they created many laws and traditions that go around laws. They created laws to even uphold the laws. That's right. And, and then Jesus says to them that you make of no effect the commandments of God by your traditions. That's right. Mm. Which were not even in the Bible. Uh, and the purpose was they did them was to protect God's law from being trampled on through disobedience. So the intentions were good. The method was totally wrong, though, totally because it wrong. wasn't done by faith. And it, if the, it is these rules and traditions that the Pharisees accused Jesus of breaking, not the Ten Commandments. They said all these other rules that they had invented themselves mm. around the Ten Commandments. And um, none of these efforts led to true righteousness. That's right. For it is impossible for man to attain righteousness by trying hard to keep God's law. And we know Paul was well aware of that. He was a Pharisee himself. Mm. He tried Pharisee all that. Pharisee of the Pharisees, he calls yeah. himself. Yeah. He tried it all, and it just didn't work. Mm. And Paul was well aware of the Jews' failure to attain righteousness when he wrote these words in Romans chapter 9, verse 30 to 32. It says, What shall we say then, that Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith? But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness has not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Well, that's a good question. Because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were, by the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone. And again, Paul mentions it again in Romans chapter 10, verse 1 to 4. He says it again. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant... Of the righteousness, and that's God's righteousness, and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Did you notice that one? They have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Mm. Or you could put in there, or Jesus. That's right. They had not submitted to the righteousness of Jesus. So there's a submission that's required, and they never submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. Why? Because they were ignorant of God's righteousness, which suggests to me that they did not know God. Yeah. They didn't really know what God was like and who and who he is, that he is a loving God, that he is a God of self-sacrificing agape love. Again, it was looking to themselves. Mm. It's just this natural response. Instead of looking to God and say, God, give me your righteousness. You're the only one who's righteous. Yeah. Give me your righteousness. I rest in your righteousness alone. And Paul understood that Christ is the only source of for righteousness for mankind. Mm. Paul understood it. So we've got to submit to God, which is another word for surrender, surrendering of submitting. You know, it says that they did not submit to God's righteousness. There's a, the book of James also talks about submitting to God. Um, James chapter 4, verse 7, for example, it says, Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So without that submission... You cannot resist, and they will, the devil won't flee either. You have no reason to flee. That's right. And so, you know, Paul understood this when he wrote these words, you know, that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. Mm. For the end or goal of the law is righteousness. Amen. For the law's precepts define what righteousness is, mm. uh, which is unattainable by man's efforts to obey it. Therefore, God sent Christ to fulfill all the requirements that the law demands for righteousness. Hence, one can become only righteous only by faith in Christ's justifying and sanctifying righteousness, or his imputed and imparted, or his justified righteous and his sanctified righteous. He's the only one who did it. Both as an expression of Christ's righteousness. That's yes. right. Amen. Beautiful. So let's have a look at the new covenant, which is God's righteousness. Mm. Now, God providing law righteousness through Christ is what the Bible calls the new covenant. Okay. Now, is the new covenant only found in the New Testament, or do we find it in the Old Testament as I well? I think you'll find it in the Old Testament as okay. well. And I think you'll find it in Jeremiah chapter 31, uh, verses 31 to 33. And okay. he's, he's giving God's telling us, the future mm, mm. Hold the days will come Says the Lord And uh, And so The Bible calls The new covenant Which is based on Better promises God's better promi promises and, and basically It's God's promise To fulfill his commandments Requirement for them And in them mm. So if there's better promises There are some promises That are the less than ideal That's right And hopefully we'll unpack That a little bit later After we get into Jeremiah yeah, You know so God's promise To fulfill his commandments Requirements For them And in them so Christ mm. did it, 
and Christ wants to give it to us. Ah, thank you, Lord. And the Old Testament prophets foretold there would be a new covenant in Jeremiah yeah. 31, verse 31. Okay. 30. People think that the new covenant you know, is only found in the New Testament. Yeah, Old Covenant, Old Testament, New Covenant, New Testament. Paul's just repeating an Old Testament promise yeah. in Jeremiah okay. about when he talks about the New Covenant. And let's read that in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31 to 33. It says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Okay, so he's talking about two covenants. There's the new covenant and then this other covenant, which was made after God led them out of Egypt. Um, and he says, my, my covenant, which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. So he didn't break his covenant. They broke the covenant. They broke the covenant. That's right. Verse 33. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. So who's going to fulfill the covenant? God says he will. (laughs) I will. Twice he says, I will do this. I will do this. So we just got to allow God to do it. Get out of the way through surrender. In the old old covenant, it was... Israel trying to fulfill the covenant, and they failed. No, one, no wonder they failed. That's right. Mm. In the new covenant, God says, listen, I'm going to fulfill the covenant. Yes. And again, he repeats it in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 25 to 27. It says, Then I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your filthiness, and from your idols I will clean you. Stop so, there. It says, Who will sprinkle? I will. <laughs> so as God says again, he will do the cleansing. Yeah. Now, it's interesting. It's not talking about the filthiness of the flesh so much because it's only using that as symbolism because the filthiness includes idols, which has got to do with having other gods before. And that can be anything, Eddie. I mean, we always think of other gods before uh, before us talking. We think of, you know, in the graven uh, images, uh, yeah, statues, statues and, you know, all these type of things, yeah. you know, pagan worship and things like that. No, an idol is anything that you put before God. Mm. And it could be sport. True. It could be your wife. Something on television. It could be your You're, wife. It yeah. could be. Uh, it could be anything that it could you be put. Music. Whatever it is that you yeah. put above God, that is your idol. Mm. Okay. So keep going there. It says, "A new heart also I will give you." Okay. It says, "And a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit I will put within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, that you shall keep my judgments, and do them." Now, if I read this correctly, by putting His Spirit within us. That will cause us to walk in God's statutes, and we will be able to keep its judgments so that we can do them. And he also gives us a new heart. Okay. I mean, just think yeah. about that, a new heart. And to do that, it says that he will take the stony heart out of our flesh, and it will give us a heart of flesh. Yeah. So what is telling us that we, by nature, have a stony heart? Yes. It's a heart that cannot feel the way that God feels love for his people and the way that we are to feel love for God. So first thing he needs to cleanse us. And then he gives us a new heart. Mm. He puts a new spirit he'll put within you. So that's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Yes. Amen. And I'll take away your stony heart out of flesh and I'll give you a heart of flesh. And then he says, I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. Yes. And you shall keep my judgments and do them. So God's doing all this. Mm. It's not us. It's God doing it. And this, when you realize that, it's such a relief. Yes. Just think about that. I don't have to do it. God says he'll do it. I just got to submit and say, God, please do it. Mm. Every day, Lord, please give me a new heart. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. You know, write your laws upon my heart. Mm. Lord, this new heart that you've given me, write your laws in there. Well, that's great news. That is good news, Colin, just to think that, you know, I don't have to keep on sinning and repenting, sinning and repenting, and keep on failing continuously. By surrender, I can receive the righteousness of Christ, and he will work in me both to will and to do, as it says there in Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, of his good pleasure. That's right. And throughout the New Testament, it is declared that Jesus Christ fulfilled the Lord's righteous requirements. Mm. And concerning this, Paul wrote of his desire to be found in him, not having my own righteousness. This is in Philippians chapter 3, verse, 3, verse 9. 9. Beautiful yeah. text. Not having mm. my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God. By faith. Okay, amen. And so Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, which is based on God's promise to provide righteousness for man. Mm. God's going to provide it. Not man's promise to become righteous by keeping God's law. It's God's promise. And, you know, when you realize this, it is such a, you know, a burden off, off you. Absolutely. 
And it's, that's why the gospel, the word gospel means good news. There's good news there, but with the gospel comes an element of the cross. We've got to preach the cross, which is where our death took place as well. When Christ died, we died with him. If we can accept that by faith, we are delivered from the sin's control over us. And then, and then if we go into the watery grave through baptism, baptism of the Holy Spirit raised to newness of life, in that sense, we have a new life in Christ, and Christ can then live his life out through us. That's right. I mean, not only that, he gives you a new heart, Etienne. Mm. He will put the spirit in you. New spirit too. He Amen. will cause you to keep his commandments. Mm. All right, because you have a think about it. If Jesus lives in us through the Holy Spirit, will not Jesus seek to keep his Father's law in and yes. through us? Yes, yeah, that's what would happen. Exactly what happens. Mm. And so all we have to do is ask him Amen. and surrender and that's the cross part. It's taking up the cross. It's surrendering to him. That's mm. the hard part. Beautiful. It's the surrender. Well, we've roughly come halfway to our study. So, dear listener, you are listening to You Shall Receive Power with Colin Hone and Etienne McClintock. We're going to take a short break here and be right back after this message. Stay tuned. Welcome to the minute that makes a difference. I'm Margot Marshall. What difference would it make to your self-control if you read the Bible? In a study, participants were given sentences containing five words to unscramble. Some contained religious themes, others didn't. Then they were asked to complete tasks that required self-control, involving enduring discomfort, delaying gratification, exerting patience and refraining from impulsive responses. Those who unscrambled the sentences with religious themes had significantly more self-control in completing their tasks, which surprised the lead researcher, who previously thought that religion had little practical use. The very book that strengthens self-control, the Bible, claims to do so. Quote, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So keep a Bible handy. It makes a difference. Dear listener, welcome back to You Shall Receive Power. And you are with Colin Hone and Etienne McClintock. And just before the break, we were talking about the importance of receiving the righteousness of God. And as Paul says there in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 9, that we are to be found in Jesus, not having our own righteousness, because we already discovered that righteousness is as filthy rags. And that righteousness is the one that comes from the law, through our efforts trying to keep the law of God. But we want to be... In Christ, through faith in him, and have the righteousness which is from God, by faith, as it says. That's right. And we had these two errors. Mm. One error was the Jews took was trying to establish a righteousness by trying to keep the law. Yes. Okay. The old covenant. Mm. And then you have the uh, another group that says, well, that's impossible. So the law, keeping the law of God is impossible. Yes. And either one of them is an error. Mm. Okay. And here is the true the truth of it, which is the New Testament, which is from the Old Testament covenant uh, promise yes. that God will do it. Mm, amen. God will justify us. God will sanctify us. God will give us a new heart. Mm. And um, he will also put a new spirit in us and cause us right, to walk in his statutes and to keep his judgments amen. and to do them. Found in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 25 to 27. That's such an encouraging text. And it's Old Testament, but it talks about the new covenant. Yeah, God's promise. God's mm. promise here. And so, you know, for me, that was a relief when I when I discovered that. Because really, I, I faulted on between the two. Between trying to do it on my, my own efforts, doesn't work. Yeah. So you give up and say it can't be done. Yes, that's right. All right. And I believe that's what the Amigo Posse is. Mm, so it's a statement of unbelief because when God says something, we've got to believe it and allow God and expect God to do exactly what he said he would do. Despite the evidence in our own life. Free will and choice still comes into the equation. God will do it if we believe him. If we don't believe him, we actually make him out to be a liar. That's right. Mm. Now we can read this in Hebrews chapter 8, okay. verse 6 to 12. This is a fantastic um, way of how Paul puts it together about the Old and New Covenant. Okay, and I think part of this is actually a quote out of Jeremiah 31, which we just read. Exactly. He's quoting out of the Old Testament. Okay, Hebrews chapter 8, reading from verse 6. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. Mm. For in that the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no place sought for a second because finding fault with them, and wanna, obviously their promises, was I, it? I want to stop right there. Whose okay. fault was it? Israel. 
Yeah, he said, I finding fault with them, mm. not with the law. Not with the covenant not, itself. Yeah, not with the covenant or the law itself. He's not saying finding fault with the law, which is many people will try and, you know, That's uh, right. twist that around. He's saying fault with them as in Israel. Mm, mm. You know, we even there, Romans chapter 7, verse 12, the Apostle Paul says, Therefore the law is holy and the commandments holy and just and good. They're not bad. They're good and they reflect the righteousness of God. We, we can see that revealed in the law. problem's not with God. problem's not with the covenant. The problem's not with the law. The problem was what Israel tried to, to do it mm. by their own strength. That's right. And that's where he found fault with them. So because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord. So the Lord doesn't give up on Israel here, does he? No. Because he's going to do something else now. When I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And what was the covenant? What was the basis of the covenant? Was the Ten Commandments the Lord exactly? God. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Because even the, the the tablets of stone were called the the tablets of the covenant. You That's know, the right. Law of the covenant. The reflection right. of God's character. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Because they did not continue in my covenant. And as we spoke previously, they hardly continued 40 days when the covenant was made. That's right. And I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother saying, know the Lord. For all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. So this knowing God is really important in regards to the covenant because it says Israel, not knowing the righteousness of God, then went trying to establish their own righteousness, which came through the works of the law. That's right. But here we are told that through the covenant, every person will know God, says from the least of them to the greatest of them. And then verse 12, I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. How good, how, isn't that great news? Oh, it's great news. That yeah. good. And here's Paul quoting um, Jeremiah 31 to 30, that, that's 31 right. to 33. He's yeah. quoting the Old Testament. Mm. But here's the problem, Edian, is that you know Christians today, we can easily fall back into the Old Covenant obedience once they accept Jesus. That's true. And and I, 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 it happens to me. It's this mm. natural fight with, with our carnal nature. Yes, and, and I guess that almost every Christian has followed the example of Israel in the wilderness, haven't we? You know, we, we yeah. accept Jesus and we're thankful for the salvation he gives them. And it's natural to ask the Lord what he wants them to do. Lord, what mm-hmm. do you want me to do? He reveals his will in his word, the Bible. So, so God reveals his will in the word, uh, the Bible. And then the natural response is, I love you, Lord. Therefore, yes. all that you ask me to do, I will do. Mm-hmm. This is the old covenant response. That's right. All that you ask me to do, because I've seen the word, you want me to do this, 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 and this. Yep, because God only wants good things for you, mm. and you want to please God. So, yeah, I'll, everything you say you do, I will do, Lord. You said that? Yep, I'm going to do that, Lord. That's yeah. old covenant response. That's right. And the old covenant principle and the new covenant principle are in the in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament, because that response you were talking about now is a modern-day response. It's not just something that's left to the, the annals of history. That's right. Or the old, old, uh, the old Testament. It, now, Galatians chapter four, uh, Paul uses a parallel. He draws a parallel between Hagar and Ishmael, and then also Sarah and Isaac. Now, Sarah and Isaac. Isaac was born to them when they were incapable of giving birth to a child. Sarah was ninety years old. She mm. was not capable of having a child whatsoever. And then God promised them that they would have a child. And we told in Hebrews chapter eleven that by faith she gained strength. Because she believed the promises of God And then she was able to conceive and have a child That's right. Now what they did is Leading up to that there was a delay of 10 years Between the promise and the fulfilling Of this promised child So they That's decided right. well the Lord said we're going to have a child Maybe after 10 years The Lord is trying to tell us that we need to do it mm. So then they get a surrogate <laughs> Name is Hagar They have a child through the surrogate And they think this is the child of promise And God says no this is not the child of promise This is the child of works And in Galatians chapter 4 Because whose works was it? Their own That's right That's right And then after that of course God says no it's not through the flesh That you're going to fulfill this promise Therefore they had circumcision entered The the flesh had to be cut off Which is really another symbol for dying to self That's right Taking up your cross and following Christ Now it says that um, It talks about the bondwoman and the free woman The bondwoman being Hagar 
It says, for it is written, Abraham had two, wa- two sons, one by a bondwoman, the other by a free woman. I'm reading out of Galatians chapter 4, verse 22. Now verse 23. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, that is Ishmael, and he of the free woman through promise, which things are symbolic, for these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar, for this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and it corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage to her children. And then it says, The Jerusalem from above is free and is the mother of us all. Now it says in verse 28, But now we, brethren, as Isaac, are children of promise. So this is the promise of the new covenant. Mm. But as he who was born according to the flesh, which is Ishmael, then persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, even so it is now. So we see in the Old Testament in the two sons of Abraham, the Old Covenant and the New Covenant played out. Right played out. And now it says here in the New Testament, this is the book of Galatians written by Paul, so even it is now. So the Old Covenant principle and the New Covenant principle still exist even in the New Testament. That's right. And it's a wall. It's a natural wall. Yes. You know, just like I was saying, you know, as a new Christian and even as old Christians, <laughs> yeah. uh, we... we we, you know, basically come into this old covenant response. Mm. You know, yes, I'll do everything you say, Lord. You know, so we enter into a life of sporadic obedience, falling and falling time and time again. You mm. probably can relate to that. I, I can know, relate to it. I can relate to that, and, and and maybe you know, listeners, you can relate to that. Mm. You know, and so what happens is uh, our Christian walk become becomes discouraging. Yes, and sometimes a burden. You know, an example. The Christians in Galatia fell into the same old covenant attitude. Mm. They became a Christian through the converting power of the Holy Spirit, but then they began trying to become just like Jesus by keeping God's law through their own efforts. So they started in faith, and then they ended up doing works. That's right. Well, yeah. we want to become just like Jesus, so yeah, we're yeah. going to we're going to keep God's law through our own efforts. Mm. And this is why Paul said in Galatians three. Own efforts is the right word I wanted to use there. Yeah, thank yes. you. Yes, in Galatians chapter three, verse three, he says, "Are you so foolish?" Having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Yeah, that, that well, that is a great question. And the verse two actually gives us the, the 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 foundation for that question. It says, "This only I want to learn from you: Did you receive the spirit? So this is the baptism of the spirit by the works of the law. So in other words, by your own righteousness, or by the hearing of faith, or that you, you know you hear the gospel, you believed it, and you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit believe, that way. Did you you know did you believe and understand the new covenant? Yeah, God says I will do it. Jesus Amen. paid the penalty for your sins on the cross. Jesus, God said, I will put your laws in my mind and heart. I will cause you to walk and keep my judgments. Mm. So, it was, so that, that, they, what they did is they veered away from what God said he would do and try to achieve it by themselves again. And we know that's an impossibility. And dear listen, if you've tried that, you would know by experience that it is an impossibility. Unless we have taken our eyes off and seen how holy and righteous God is, and then we go about it trying to establish our own righteousness. And we may right. be trying to do this in ignorance, but really we fall short of the mark. That's right. And, mm. and Paul's purpose was never to do away with or abolish God's law. Not at all. I mean, in answer to this false accusation, he replied in Romans chapter 3, verse 31, you know, do we then make void the law through faith? Another excellent question. God forbid, yeah. yeah. We establish the law. We establish the law by faith. That's right. Amen. So, so when the Christian enters into the new covenant through faith in Christ, for his righteous obedience, the law is being established in his heart and life by his faith. Mm. The Holy Spirit begins then writing God's law in the heart. And we read that in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3. It says, Clearly you are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is of the heart. Now, I remember I was in the Philippines and... Um, they sent me. To, I was over there doing some preaching and revival meetings and evangelistic meetings, mm. and uh, they took me to this monthly meeting where they got all the different denominations together, and uh, they said we want you to take you know to, to today's uh, lesson as a visitor. Yes, uh, it was an Adventist um, turn this month, and it just happened to be when oh, I was there. When so you were there, right? So they so they pulled well, me, they pulled me in, and so I went through the Protestant Reformation, how God was trying to restore different things that were lost in God's word. Hmm. You know, baptism by immersion, not yes. sprinkling baptism, that were lost through the dark ages. And how God raised up different denominations, you know, the Baptist to bring back full immersion and, you know, Methodist with prayer and evangelism, how he's restoring the sanctuary uh, truths that were lost in the dark yes, ages, yes. the sanctuary that was trampled During on. the falling away, yeah. The falling away. Mm. And then I finally got to, you know, what was the last thing in the sanctuary 
that that uh, that Satan do think was trying to you know destroy it, and we go into the most holy place, and it was God's law. And I read this Romans three verse thirty one, and then I read Second Corinthians chapter three verse three, and I said to them, "Well, what was written on the table of stones?" And they said, Ten Commandments." Mm. I said, "What does God want to write on our hearts?" Mm. After reading that, they said the Ten Commandments. Amen. And many of them um, joined the Seven Day Venice Church, and some of their whole churches came across when they realised that they'd been preaching against the law of God, mm. just because of their misunderstanding of the Word of God and what they were taught. Sure, sure. You know, and once they realised that the Word of God is, you know, that God's a new covenant, He wants to write on their mind and hearts the whole Ten Commandments. Yes. Yeah, uh, yeah. Some come right across and became Seven Day Venice, um, uh, wanting to be under the new covenant, where Jesus has paid the penalty for our sins and cleansed us, and mm. he wants to write his laws, Ten Commandments, including the Seventh-day Sabbath, on our mind and hearts and cause us to walk in his statutes. Amen. Mm. So, you know, we, we see that the New Covenant does not do away with God's law. It doesn't at all. That it was establishes the, the law. That's right. Yeah. God's law is still present. Uh, the only change that has taken place is the Christian's relationship to the law. Yes, indeed. That's yeah. what's happened. Before one accepts Christ, the law condemns him as a sinner deserving of death, doesn't it? The mm. law convicts us of sin and says, well, the penalty of sin is eternal death. You know, once one accepts Christ as his saviour, the law condemnation no longer rests upon him, does it? It doesn't. That's because right. Christ suffered on the cross for him mm. or her that the condemnation and death penalty for his or her sin. Yes. Therefore, he is now free from the guilt and death penalty for sin. Mm. So as Paul stated the matter, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. That's found in Galatians 3, chapter 3, verse 24. Right. So the law actually shows us our sin and therefore our need of a savior, That's but right. also shows us that we are incapable of saving ourselves. You see, without the law, we wouldn't know what sin is. That's true. Okay. Sin is transgression of the law. And yes. then if we didn't have... if we didn't know what sin is, we wouldn't need a saviour. Mm. Okay, so it's, you can't have one without the other. Yeah, I love what you said there before, Colin, about the fact that our relationship to God and our relationship to his constitution or his law changes. You know, um, we were reading in Second Corinthians chapter 3 there before, and verse 7 says that if the ministration of death, now what is the ministration of death? We'll find as we read, written and engraved on stones was glorious. So this is the Ten Commandments in That's relation right. to sinners. It cannot minister life, and Paul deals with that in Romans 7. Um, the ministration of death written in great the stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away. How will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? And then verse 9, for if the ministration of condemnation had glory, the ministration of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. So our relationship to the Lord changes. From the ministration of death to the ministration of glory or the ministration of righteousness through the Holy Spirit and by receiving Christ into our lives. That's right. So, you know, for example, you know, as I said, the law brings us to Jesus that we might be justified by faith. Yes. But once the Christian accepts Christ, what is his natural response? He wants to keep God's law. He wants to be faithful to the Lord. That's yeah, right. because the Spirit is putting the desire in his heart to obey that. Mm. You know, before he became a Christian, he didn't even care about keeping God's law. That's right. But now you want to keep God's law. You've accepted Jesus, and you want to keep his law and obey him mm. uh, out of love. Yes. And so, however, he, he, we soon learn, don't we, that it's impossible to keep God's law by trying hard to obey it. And so the law becomes his schoolmaster, pointing him to Christ as a sanctifying Savior as well. Mm. Not only a justifying Savior, but a sanctifying saviour. So the and complete sanctifi package. Yeah, sanctify means becoming holy. Yes. Being set aside for be holy purposes. Transformed purpose. and changed, being renewed by yeah. the transformation of your minds. Yeah. Sanctified means to be set aside for holy purposes. Mm. And so he learns, and how we, we need to learn to look to Jesus, and that's found in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, mm. who's the author and finisher of our faith. I love the fact that Jesus is the author of faith, so I don't have to go and try and establish my own faith. I can receive his faith. Yeah, so it says mm. Jesus is what? The author? And finisher. And finisher. So what he began, he mm. will finish. And so he learns to look to Jesus when he is tempted. So when you're tempted, we learn to look to Jesus, asking Jesus to give us his victory over the temptation that may came, come mm. our way. Mm. Therefore, we experience Christ as our justifying saviour and our sanctifying saviour and we enter into this fully into the new covenant experience through faith in christ 
So because the, the gospel, the gospel is a gospel of deliverance from sin. Amen. Not from not only from the penalty of sin, but the power as well. But the power as well. Mm. You know, and Paul understood this gospel of victory over sin when he wrote these words in Romans chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. And I love this. He's just been talking about the fact that where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. And then he says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Romans 6, verse 1, now 6, verse 2. Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? That's right. And so what happens is normally, you know, we want to fight sin, but we try and fight sin on our own. Mm. Using our own strength And that's why we keep falling That's right Because we have not submitted ourselves to God and His righteousness And ask Jesus to have the victory Mm. To ask Him and and, and, and And submit And to be hidden in Christ really We want to be hidden and shielded from the darts of the enemy So here in that verse in Romans chapter 6 verse 1 and 2 Paul clearly states that the follower of Jesus Christ Should not be living a life of habitual sin, doesn't he? That's right And then he goes on to explain why this is so In Romans chapter 6 verse 3 to 7 says, or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection." Knowing that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. So how do we be free from sin? By having ourselves crucified with Christ, that the old man can be taken away, therefore the body of sin may be done away with. That's right. So, so that we can be set free from that slavery that we are in, in, inherently uh, struggling we with. We don't have to be slaves to sin anymore. Mm, and Paul is telling us in these verses that all who have accepted Jesus Christ, so if you've accepted Jesus Christ, and I, and I pray and hope that you have accepted this wonderful gift as, as Jesus our Lord and Savior, and this gift he paid the penalty for your sins, and that your sins can be tr- were transferred to him and he took that penalty upon himself for you. Mm. If you accept this, then Paul is telling us that all who have accepted Jesus Christ died with him on the cross and were buried with him in the grave. Amen. Therefore, the old sinful nature you, the sin loving you and the sin loving me, the prideful you and the prideful me, the unforgiving you, the unforgiving me, the angry mm. you, the lustful you is mm. dead and buried with Christ. Therefore, Thank you, Lord. Yeah, yeah. therefore, your old sinful nature is dead and buried and need not control you any longer. Mm. That's great news. So when That's you are tempted news. to sin, this is what we do. We're to believe that our old sinful nature that once controlled you or me need not control you anymore. Mm. We've got to believe that it doesn't have to control me anymore. Yes. And you do not need to yield to the temptation to sin. And at the moment of temptation, you simply put that sinful you back on the cross and believe it is dead and buried with Christ. Amen. This is what it means to die daily mm. and to take up your cross daily. Now, knowing this to be a fact and that you don't have to live the old sinful life of sin, Paul goes on to write in Romans chapter 6, verse 8 to 14. He comes and says these words to sort of show you how. Okay, so it's reading on in Romans chapter 6, starting verse 8. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe we shall also live with him, knowing that... Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. The word dominion there I find very interesting because it comes up a little bit later. But death no longer has dominion over him. Death no longer rules over him. He lives and he Mm. lives for all eternity. He's got eternal life and this is what he gives us. It says in verse 10, For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, that the life that he lives, he might live to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lust, and do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead. So that's that spiritual life we get through the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. And here this word dominion comes up Just as dominion Mm. Death no longer has dominion over Christ Now listen to what it says about dominion in regards to us It says for sin shall not have dominion over you For you are not under law 
but under grace. Under the law of sin, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> but under grace. Because, but, but grace actually then removes that that sin principle that controls us because we receive the righteousness of Christ and he's able to live his life out through us. That's right. Because you have died with Christ and you were buried with him, you have been also raised up with Christ and you can live a life of obedience to God. Mm. For you are now dead and dead to sin, but alive to God through grace through Jesus our Lord. Therefore, mm. you need not yield your members as instruments to unrighteousness. I love that. In his letter, Galatians and Paul is clearly stating or describing how the Christian is to live an obedient life in Christ. So we're going to look at, and uh, in our next um, program, we're going to look at the how. We've talked about the what can happen, yes, the yes. promises God's made. We're going to look into and get really into the nitty gritty of how we can have victory over sin, mm. how we can live, live an obedient life. And, um, you know, probably one of my favorite Bible verses, right in, especially of Paul's writing, is found in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Actually, that's my favorite as well. It's where yeah. the answer is found. Mm. And he describes how the Christian is to live an obedient life through Christ. He goes and says these wonderful words. He says, I am crucified with Christ, step number one. Amen. Are we crucified with Christ? Self-denial, death in Jesus, yes. Yeah. Uh, Are you crucified with Christ? Mm. And then he he realizes, though, that nevertheless, I live. I'm still alive. Mm -hmm. Paul was still alive, even though he was crucified with Christ. But he says that word there, it's no longer I who lives, isn't it? Yeah. Yet not I. Mm. So Paul's saying, I don't live anymore. That old Paul, you know, the one before? The old man which you refer to in Romans chapter 6? Yeah. He was crucified with Christ. Mm. Amen. You know, all my sins were crucified with Christ. So all our liabilities, everything, everything. our sins, everything. Our, our record. Thank you, Lord. And But Christ liveth in me. What he's saying is now Christ lives in me. Now, That's seems, the secret. Yeah, there seems to be a transaction because if we've been crucified with Christ, we have to find ourselves by faith in Christ Jesus. Yeah. But not only are we to be found in Christ, Christ is to be found in us. Which is so the it's resurrection. It's a relationship, yeah. Amen. We're raised with Christ into mm. the new life. The resurrection, the death, die to death to self, raised to a new life. And he says, I'm raised to a new life, this new life that I've been raised to, it's Christ living in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, so Paul realizes, hey, listen, I still live in the flesh. Yes. I still have a sinful nature. Yeah. I'm going to have that until glorification, mm. until the yes. resurrection. The flesh will always be with us until glorification, you're to right. To glorification yes. when Jesus yes. comes and the dead Mm. Uh, the dead are raised and they're giving a new body and also those who are living will be giving a new body. And he says, which I now live in the flesh. So you realize I still have a sinful nature, but I now live by the faith of the Son of God. Mm. I live by faith of the Son of God and who loved me gift from and Jesus. gave himself to me. Amen. Well, dear listener, we're just going to take a break and share our contact details with you. Stay tuned and we'll be right back after these messages. Thank you for joining us on You Shall Receive Power. If you would like more information about today's program, or if you have any questions, please contact 3ABN Australia Radio by phoning 0249 73 3456. Or you can send an email to radio at 3abnaustralia.org.au. You can also contact us on our 3ABN Australia Radio Facebook page. We look forward to hearing from you. Dear listener, welcome back. Just before the break, Colin and myself were talking about this beautiful text in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, which explains really in a nutshell the beauty of the gospel, which is good news for all sinners that we can actually have our death taken care of because the law demands our death. The law is the ministration of death to the sinner. However, when the ministration of life through the Holy Spirit writes the laws in our hearts and our minds, we can receive life. However, preceding life, there's death, and we can be crucified with Christ because there we find the demands of the law satisfied in regards to our death, but we find more in Christ Jesus. We also find our righteousness, which is another thing the law demands. That's right. Mm-hmm. Jesus said you must be born again to Nicodemus, mm-hmm. and to be born again, we must die to self first. Amen. We've got to be crucified mm-hmm. with Christ. And then and then Paul goes and explains, but you're still alive. You still have a sinful nature. That's right. And, yeah. But, but what he's saying is, the key is having Jesus live in you, mm, and mm. that's the new life that I live in the flesh. 
I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself to me. And so in our next program, we're going to talk about how we can live a Christian or how a Christian can live an obedient life by first telling us how he did it and accept the fact that he was crucified with Christ. That's the first step mm. is we need to be crucified with Christ. Die to self. Amen. So just to summarize what we said, the law of Ten Commandments is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Now, what work does the law do? The law shows us our sin and our need of a Savior. When we see that we are condemned under the law, we desire something better. We, first of all, desire to be released from our guilt. Yes. Our condemnation, re- released from the penalty of the law. So we get that in Christ because we can be crucified by faith. Justification. And then, of course, also to now be released from the old man, that sinful control that has uh, controlled us all our lives, and then we can walk in newness of life. So the old man can be destroyed through the cross, and then the new man we can receive through Christ Jesus. By Dear Christ listener, living in us. Amen. Amen. Dear listener, thank you for joining us today on You Shall Receive Power. We pray that God will bless you, and we look forward to catching up with you next time. been listening to a production of 3ABN Australia Radio.